Good morning, Westminster. Pastor Kelly here, and I am having a conversation today with Chuck Johnson, who is a friend of the congregation, son of Sarah Johnson, brother to Bruce, and he's doing some important work out in the world. And in honor of this year's Hiroshima Remembrance Day, he has agreed to sit down with us and share about some of his work. So we as a congregation have been talking about the danger of a single story this summer, and we have dusted off and explored what might be other stories, other perspectives on some of our well-known cultural understandings of the world, of our own scriptural stories. So I'm gonna pose this very question to Chuck. So Chuck, one of the stories I'm gonna suggest that we believe and it is a single story I think that many folks share, is that we believe nuclear weapons keep us safe. And so I'm going to hand it over to Chuck. Are there any other stories or any other ways to think about nuclear weapons in our world besides this one narrative that they single-handedly keep us safe? Well, there, there definitely are, um, but that is, as you say, a really strong narrative, uh, particularly in the countries that have nuclear weapons. Um, uh, sort of the justification for having them is that we need them to keep our, our uh, enemies at bay, uh, that they won't feel safe to attack us because they know we have this horrible weapon. And uh, this movie Oppenheimer that's come out, um, you know, deals with these questions of, of you know, do they keep us safe versus do they threaten uh, complete annihilation? And the answer to both is yes, <laughs> because um, the only way that, that they provide safety is by threatening catastrophe. Um, but that means then that you, in order to be safe, in order to continue to serve that function, this has to work indefinitely, you know. Um, so deterrence, as they call it, nuclear deterrence, deterring the other country from attacking you, works uh, works as a way of preventing someone from attacking you until it doesn't, you know. Um, and at this point, we've, we've been in the nuclear age now uh, for... Um, it's, it's approaching 80 years, um, and uh, uh, at some point, though, uh, you ha you're always relying on leaders um, who are sane. You're always relying on um, technology not failing, people not making a mistake and thinking that something is attacking them and, and, re and reacting to it. We've had some false alarms over the years of... Uh, and for example, there was a, a very famous one where the Russians thought the people who were in charge of unleashing the missiles on us believed that, um, that they were being attacked. And under their protocols, they should have attacked us. But because of the commander who was in charge at that time, realizing how terrible things would be and just sort of not believing it was really happening, he made the judgment decision for which he was later demoted of not attacking the United States. I think they were grateful that he didn't do it, but he didn't do what he had been required to do. Had he done what he'd been required to do, we would have had a nuclear war with Russia over a false alarm. Um, these kinds of things, especially when uh, this, the nuclear superpowers are um, in a hostile relationship, as, as we currently are right now, um, are become you know, a possibility. A false alarm could lead to um, an exchange of nuclear weapons that would be catastrophic. Um, so, do they keep us safe? No, they actually threaten our existence. And this is one of the things that uh, in the 1980s, some additional research was done into this phenomenon they call nuclear winter. Mm -hmm. Nuclear weapons are bad in and of themselves. If somebody drops a nuclear bomb on a city, we saw what happened to Hiroshima, we saw what happened to Nagasaki. It killed, and in the case of Hiroshima, I think about 120,000 people. Nagasaki was about 100, something like that, um, you know, in the, within the first couple of months of, of, it, of, of the bomb being dropped. Um, but the um, additional effect if you have a, a nuclear attack with two sides using 
multiple nuclear weapons, depending on how many get used, um, you start fires that can take soot into the upper atmosphere and actually change the climate. Sort of the reverse of what uh, uh, climate change is, is happening in terms of the, the uh, CO2 uh, keeping heat mm -hmm. on the earth. This would block the sun's rays from getting to the earth and create what they call a nuclear winter. And this effect was something that Carl Sagan and uh, a number of other scientists in the 1980s um, researched and wrote papers about. And uh, eventually it was accepted that it was a legitimate effect of a nuclear exchange and that it might be fatal to humanity if the United States and, and the USSR at the time had actually had a full scale nuclear war. It might actually extinguish human life and a lot of other species as well. Um, after the Cold War ended, it looked as though the United States and USSR and then Russia, which was their successor country, were beginning to limit the number of weapons they had, reducing the numbers. Um, we had a few other countries get nuclear weapons, India, Pakistan, Israel already had them, uh, and uh, North Korea. Um, but uh, the general feeling was that the danger had abated. Um, and that we had arms control agreements and that we were nobody would be dumb enough to start a nuclear war. People are not feeling so secure anymore on that. Um, they shouldn't have felt that way before because as long as these, these are around, this, this threat exists and, and at some point we'll get unlucky and it'll happen. Um, but right now it seems a lot more um, in people's faces because of the invasion of Ukraine Russia's weakness and their ability to fight Ukraine has caused them to threaten nuclear weapons more and more. And in fact, if the Ukrainians counteroffensive becomes too successful, there is a real fear that they'll use nuclear weapons to defeat the Ukrainian army and then break that barrier that we haven't broken since Nagasaki and make it legitimate to use the smaller tactical nuclear weapons in warfare, which could lead to the catastrophic results. It certainly would be extremely catastrophic in Ukraine to even use these so-called smaller tactical nuclear weapons. Um, the other danger in Ukraine um, is the nuclear power has spread around the around the world, and it's you know the peaceful use of nuclear technology, but it also has a lot of uh, radioactive material and uh, danger associated with it, and. Uh, in, in this war, for the first time, nuclear power plants have been weaponized um, by Russia, taking over Chernobyl site and then Zaporizhia. They gave up Chernobyl, but, but there's threats that um, Zaporizhia might be uh, uh, caused to melt down, um, either by accident, um, because they're fighting a war around it, and then they accidentally hit it, or intentionally. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, you know, Obviously, there are many, many narratives. This, is, this becomes extremely complicated. Our view at, at uh, International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War is that uh, in the case of nuclear weapons, we absolutely, the only, the only safe way, the only way to be safe, uh, to go back to your original question, is to get rid of nuclear weapons entirely. Um, and um, that's what we've been working to, to do. We've we were uh, involved with a group called the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. Uh, we helped to set it up, and it's a, it's a worldwide coalition of over 500 groups that have been promoting uh, a UN treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons that was created in 2017 in New York at the UN. Uh, it now has uh, 94 uh, people who have either uh, countries that have either signed or ratified, or both. Um, and uh, we've had our first meeting of states parties. We're having our second one in New York uh, this year. And we're hoping to use this treaty to, you know, make it clear to the, the nine countries that have nuclear weapons and their allies that we're done with this era of trying to maintain safety by walking on a tightrope. Mm -hmm. Um, that, you know, the tightrope act is, is old, the, the line's getting a little frayed, and it would be a lot safer and better for everyone if we just got rid of them and agreed with one another for intensive uh, inspections like we know how to do 
uh, to verify that they got rid of them, but to have an international agreement like the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons or separate agreements between the nuclear weapon states, however they want to orchestrate it, to get rid of these weapons. Nice. I think the tightrope analogy is a helpful one um, to understand that, okay, if, if the tightrope is the approach that might not be the safest method and that the abolition of nuclear weapons is a safer route, it is a better story than continuing this. If we all just have a good day every day, everything will be okay and no one can ever have a bad day, act irrationally, otherwise there's some significant consequences. Yeah. So your organization and you will be heading shortly after you're finished here in Oregon to another conference, to a gathering. Will you share a little bit about what that is and what it will be? Yeah, this is the uh, Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Um, in this case, it's called a Preparatory Committee. Every five years, they have a review conference. Uh, it's a treaty that was established in 1970 with a really good purpose, which was to kind of put a cap on the number of countries that have nuclear weapons. And then uh, as part of the deal, it has what they call three pillars. The first pillar is that the signatories agree that they're going to, uh, they're not going to develop nuclear weapons. And with five exceptions, there are five countries that were already acknowledged nuclear weapon states. These are the five members of the UN Security Council. Uh, and uh, that's the United States, uh, USSR then, but now Russia, uh, the United Kingdom, France, and China. And those five countries in Article 6 are supposed to be negotiating with each other to eliminate their nuclear weapons. Uh, so that pillar has kind of frozen in place and now it's kind of going in the opposite direction as those countries develop more. There were some countries that didn't join it. Um, Israel never joined it. Um, India and Pakistan did not join it. Um, and they all developed nuclear weapons. Um, and uh, North Korea was part of the treaty initially, but uh, in the early 2000s when um, they decided that to develop nuclear weapons, they pulled out and, uh, and they're no longer in the treaty. So there are nine countries that have nuclear weapons. Um, and then the third pillar of this, of this treaty was uh, promoting the peaceful use of nuclear technologies. So um, this, uh, I was talking about Zaporizhia. We don't see uh, the, pro the chance for a lot of progress on the other two pillars. Um, but on the issue of peaceful uses, uh, this whole militarization of nuclear power plants is threatening the peaceful use of nuclear energy. And ironically for us, we're, we're an organization that doesn't favor nuclear power for the most part. There's a couple of our affiliates that do. So we're not 100% unanimous on that. But uh, because of the issues of safety and health and, uh, and proliferation, you know, when you have the technologies, it gives you the capacity to build nuclear weapons and the knowledge. So as long as nuclear power is around, the knowledge and the capacity to make nuclear weapons exists. So for those reasons, we've been against it, but we're, we're going to be, uh, we've already started advocating uh, that they establish demilitarized zones around all nuclear power plants during wartime. Mm -hmm. That's not an international agreement right now. There's no, and, and the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, this is very germane. If they want to have develop nuclear power and have the peaceful uses, uh, what could be more disastrous to that goal than to have a nuclear power plant uh, exploded in a war? People are going to are going to shy away from that type of power. So really, it shouldn't be us that are promoting this. And yet, the nuclear industry and the countries that are promoting nuclear industry are a little bit afraid to talk about this issue, because even discussing it reminds people that these plants have inherent uh, safety problems, and everything has to go right with them for them to be safe. And in a wartime, you can't guarantee that. But we're hoping because Europe is concerned about Zaporizhia, uh, that some of these European allies of the United States will prevail upon them and that we can get an agreement. Uh, the International Atomic Energy Agency, which we normally don't work with closely because on, on the nuclear power issue, because they're, they're, one of their goals is to promote nuclear energy, but they've been very forthright themselves because they know that uh, 
they need to have this principle. They asked the Security Council for it and didn't get it. But we're going to be talking about that at the in Vienna at the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty uh, Preparatory Committee meetings, and hopefully we'll get something nice. on that. We'll see. So for any of Westminster's members or friends who want to read more about or learn more about this kind of work, do you have any places you would recommend they go or places they can read more? Uh, yeah, I think uh, uh, people are used to going to websites at this point and probably the easiest and quickest way would be to go, you can go to our website, I would suggest that just so you can see a little bit more about what we're doing and that's www.ipp -p as in Paul, uh, NW, uh, dot org, um, and also the overall organization that works on this, I highly recommend going to ICANN's website, and their website is www.icanw, <laughs> it's not, it, uh, dot org, because it's International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, and we call it ICANN, the, the W is silent, uh, <laughs> but not at the website. So. Uh, I suggest going to those two places to start. Great. And, and also, I, I, I would recommend going to Oppenheimer. Uh, I feel that that movie really um, opens the questions for people, just as uh, Oppenheimer himself had all of those questions. And the way that it ends, it, it, it shows the realization that Oppenheimer and a lot of these scientists had mm -hmm. that perhaps they had created this worst case scenario that they were worried about when they, before they exploded the first nuclear device, that they might have an uncontrolled chain reaction. And, and the, the conversation, the, the way that the, the director sets this up in this made up conversation between uh, Oppenheimer and Einstein is brilliant. And it ends the movie with a, with a giant question for people to be pondering. I, I recommend it. Well, thank you for sharing your expertise, for giving us some of your time give a wave to Sarah, Bruce, the rest of the congregation. Uh, thank you for coming out. Yep. It's good to have you. Thank you.